Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. It is the 26th of October 2014 today. And we're going to be talking about a few books starting on uh, one more of the transition trilogies. I know um, Salvatore took the title, but really there are a lot of these transition trilogies. First, however, I want to really quickly talk about Realms of War. Uh, this is one of the last anthologies before we hit 4th edition. Really only a, a couple worth mentioning in here. Um, I, I've, I've talked about a few of them before, back in the early days when I was trying to actually read every single story in the year that it took place, and then I realized that was just a map for insanity. But uh, ones definitely worth mentioning are Paul S. Kemp's story. It's uh, uh, more about Rivlin and his mother and all the hijinks there. I also really like Julie Johnson's story in here for some reason. It just sucked me in right from the beginning. And the final story in it is one by Richard Lee Byers that has to do with his Haunted Lands trilogy. And if you've been listening to this, you know that I'm really enjoying that. So I dug it, and it also kind of dealt with something that was similar to the Cordell story, I, I think, in here. Um, you know, it dealt with someone who has to deal with being a deserter. And, and what comes out of that. I I just found that an interesting little side avenue to explore, and I, I thought it was a cool idea to explore that. Also, it's got this great, like, <laughs> this great little, like, two-sentence summation of what the Haunted Lands trilogy is about. And uh, basically, Barrera shows up and is like, you know what's been going on, right? Uh, not really. Here you go. And, and it's like, you know, available at fine book uh, purveyors of, and bookstores nationwide. So I thought that was quite enjoyable. But really, those two, those three stories were the only kind of standout ones. Everything else, I mean, nothing necessarily that was like, ah, oh, this is terrible or whatever. Except maybe the friggin' Salvatore one about Thibbledorf. Thibbledorf point. But overall, um, just nothing... The, the anthologies anymore I feel really frustrated by, uh, and I'm I'm kind of sad because I, I really enjoyed the earlier ones, like, way more than I thought I would, but the later ones, just not, not doing it for me that much. So let's talk about books one and two of The Empyrean Odyssey by Thomas Reed. The Gossamer Plain and the Fractured Sky. And this also marks what I hope is the last time this is going to happen, since we're pushing ahead a hundred years here pretty quickly. But I hope this is the last time where I find out that a book actually takes place over a decade before I thought it took place. The uh, Gossamer Plane, if you look on Olav's page, you'll notice the Gossamer Plane says it starts in seven, or, uh, 1373, and... Uh, you know, I just assumed that it was going to have some flashbacks or that it was going to start there, and so I put it on the list where it ends, 1385. Literally a page and a half at the very end takes place in 1385. But Reed, for some reason, in this in this era of, of Forgotten Realms where everybody is putting the exact time down to the date, year, and telling you what the year is every chapter, even when it tells you beforehand, for some reason, Reed does not put the year in. And so... It finally clicked about halfway through. There's an event that happens where I'm like, oh, this has to be within about a year of when Faroon was alive. Uh, Faroon, the character from War of the Spider Queen, not Faroon, <laughs> all of Toril. And, and when that happened, I was like, I think this is happening a little earlier than 1385. And then it ends, and I was like, well, okay, maybe not. Uh, and then you read the next one. Fractured Sky starts out very quickly, and it's like, hey, for that last page and a half of book one, it, you were 12 years in the future and you didn't realize it. Something happens, and it doesn't really make much sense how 12 years passed, but for whatever reason, you know, there's a lot of planar hopping and craziness going on here, so it's like, for whatever reason, 12 years passed, most of that book one takes place in uh, 1373. Very quickly talking about book one, I, I was really worried because I did not much care for the Gossamer Plane. We essentially have two halves to the story. We've got Kynar Valk, which I, I don't know if I mentioned it back during War of the Spider Queen, but these two characters are pretty standout, both half-demons. Uh, uh, Kynar Valk is always described as a Cambion, and uh, Elysia, uh, his 
consort, concubine, cohort, is always described as an alu. I don't know if there's really any technical difference besides male and female. But in any case, I, I, I did really enjoy them back in War of the Spider Queen. They just seemed so much fun, and, uh, you know, you kind of wanted to see more of them. And here we have a lot more of them. First half of it is essentially Kaner is on this quest, and you know that he's using Elysia, but you don't know for what. And Kaner's working with, oh, uh, uh, <laughs> he's got the weirdest name, Zajian, which... I always think of, you know, have you ever seen, like, how sometimes people uh, abbreviate Asian as A-Z-N? This is Asian, but with a Z at the front, so I always in my head heard Azen, you know, like A-Z-N, because it just, my mind reads them both the same way, I guess, you know? It's like you get to Asian in the end, but there's a Z involved, so Asian. So in any case, it's Kanervok and Asian and uh, one other dude who's like Mishuk or whatever. Anyway, point being... They're on this quest, and they're going to meet up with Elysia and accomplish something. You never really know because at the end of the book, Kaner gets uh, betrayed by Asian, who's actually working for Cyric for some purpose that we don't find out until the very end of book two. But so the other half of the book, oh, and, and that that half of the book I just skimmed. I just skimmed, 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 skimmed because it was so, like, worthless. I mean, it was just uh, filler fights. Nothing interesting really happened except for the point where he gets betrayed, which was, uh, he gets betrayed twice, and both of those were kind of interesting, but then it just kind of turned into more fights, more fights, more fights, and it was like, seriously, this is all we get with these interesting characters? Alicia's half of the book is, she is, and the kind of why they thought this would happen and why it did happen didn't make much sense to me, but she is captured by angels because for some reason they're interested in the child within her that she didn't even know she had. And of course, you know, that's the thing that happens halfway through the book where you find out Faroon must have been alive. Though she assumes that the father is Kaner, uh, the father was in fact Faroon. Uh, so it's this half drow, quarter human, quarter demon child. And for whatever reason, one of the uh, one of the angels just decides to like keep him as a sidekick, and that seemed a little odd as well. I a lot of the angelic motivation and reasoning here didn't make much sense to me, but I was like, okay, whatever. I mean, they're they're angels. I don't need to necessarily get it. And while Elysia is there giving birth, and while her son is growing up, which that's another thing. The son is like. He seems to be somewhere around 20, so somehow that happened, like, within another plane, and then she was captured for 12 years, and I don't know, like, it's, it's, the time in here is odd, but we're just gonna, you know, I'm not gonna worry about it in any case, or, or, I don't know, maybe this kid was just friggin' special age some crazy way, I don't know, and I don't question it, because it's not really point of the story, and I'm not one of those people who nitpicks things like that, it's like, okay, kid's like 16, whatever. We'll run with it. Where was I going with that? <laughs> it's 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 a it's a bit convol. It, it's really simple. Yet trying to explain it, it turns out convoluted. So, Alicia's half of the story is she's trapped in this world. She she accidentally makes a vow, doesn't realize how far reaching it is, and she's kind of trapped in the the in the heavens. And um, Torin, the the angel who's captured her is basically trying to force her to understand empathy. I, I I also didn't really like this half of the book, even though I, I read it because, you know, it, there was uh, stuff happening, because it felt to me like the book was all about, well, Kaner, because he's this alpha male, he gets all the fights, and Alicia, because she's a female, basically, she gets she's going to have the, uh, you know, she's turned to compassion and blah, 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 and it just seemed... Slightly sexist and incredibly obvious, um, you know, wh where it was going. I'm happy to say with book two, it gets so much better. It's weird because uh, the Haunted Lands trilogy, I loved book two so much more than book one, and here I felt the same thing. Book two, I was all prepared to skip through uh, ne unnecessary fight scenes, redundant fight scenes, but... Um, Actually, like, I think there was maybe one that I skipped through, but most of them were really well used. There's a, there's one near the beginning where essentially all these people are forced to work together now because Asian has uh, betrayed them. 
uh, Asians working for Sirik. Kaner wants revenge on Asian because he betrayed him. Uh, Alicia has started to change enough that she wants to. She kind of wants to protect her son. She's been with Kaner so long that she still wants to be around him, and she at least respects what Torin was trying to do to her with the mind control. Little shades of V for Vendetta there. Uh, so she's just like with the group of her own accord, and Torin uh, realizes that this is a plot of Sirik. He doesn't know what the plot is, but he's like, Sirik is here in the heavens, that's not good, we need to stop him. Uh, and Kale, Kale is her son, uh, not like Erebus Kale, K-A-E-L. But I'm assuming Kale, I don't know, in any case, almost Kal-El. <laughs> but in any case, uh, Kale is going along because Torin is, you know, he's his sidekick, right? So it's, it's this big quest for them trying to stop Asian and whatever he's up to. During the Fractured Sky, all this great stuff happens. Oh, and the, the, the thing that I was going to point out is that there's this, there's this uh, action scene early on where it's used to showcase Kale versus Kaner and the uh, friction that they have, and that is mirrored by a fight very late in the book where they're actually helping each other out. And it's not like... It's not like a buddy comedy. It's not like they're great with each other, but they do learn how to work as a unit through the entire book. And I really liked what Reed was doing. He's doing some really subtle character development in here. Whereas book one was kind of like an anvil dropped on your head. Although I did really like that at the end of book one, Alicia, who was falling into this compassionate, you know, foreseeable plot line, kind of has this spell yanked out of her. And it's like, oh, you know... We put a spell on you to make you more malleable that you didn't know about. I'm going to take that away so you can be yourself again. And now she's like, oh, shit, dude. Like, you both tried to screw me over, yet it did still have some effect on her and blah, 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 blah. But anyway, it's it's it, I, I was really happy that that wasn't as obvious as it first appeared. Big events happen in the Fractured Sky. Literally, the sky fractures because Tyr murders Helm. It happens off screen, but we hear about it pretty quickly. I'm I'm really shocked that so much of the fourth ed uh, stuff that's going on happens off screen. I mean, the spell plague, I believe, hits on screen in like three different books, but for the most part, it's you know, it's like, why did Tyr kill Helm? What were they disagreeing over? I, uh, as far as I know, we never know. I th there might be more uh, gods killing each other that happen between here and fourth edition that I'm just not familiar with. For whatever reason, they decided to keep it almost entirely off screen for all of this, even though we have a lot of trilogies dealing with the transition. Unless Ghost King is going to have it all on screen, but from what I've seen of it, it doesn't sound like that would make much sense. So yeah, Tyr kills Helm and the skies in heaven begin to fracture. Different skies are bleeding through and it's really weird imagery and really well done i thought and also the ending is a little videodrome which i thought was kind of cool because essentially the climax of the book is Cyric murdering mistra but what happens is we see uh, uh alicia enters the duomer heart this area where apparently she's able to like, see the future some, and she sees it play out and realizes that them trying to stop Sirik's plan is instrumental in the plan for Sirik to kill Mistra, and she sees it happen, and she realizes, oh, crap, they're using us. So she runs back to try to get it to not happen, and then, of course, it, they're be <laughs> I don't know how to describe this. They're being used, but not in the way that they thought they were, and so, of course, she just plays into it by doing this. But it all happens off screen. Their part in it is very small. It's not as instrumental as they were led to believe. And so essentially, once she realizes this, she's like, oh, crap. And then, like, the last sentence is like, and then her world imploded. There's a lot of, like, and then the world exploded or and then her b entire being imploded. There's a lot of that going on in here. It's like, Reed doesn't just like saying she passed out. You know, it's always, everything ever exploded. It's like, no, it it just... <laughs> it's it's. I get that some pretty big things are happening in this trilogy, but he uses it to the point where really it's like, you know, somebody walks into a tree and then the world imploded. 
So pretty big stuff uh, throughout here. I'm really shocked that there's an entire book left in this trilogy. I don't know what the hell Reed is going to do with that whole book. But I'm digging it overall. Uh, the only one of the 4th edition crossover trilogies that I haven't been liking so far is the Salvatore one, and really it's confining itself very much to Drizzt's section of the world. Uh, so far that I've seen, it doesn't deal with um, anything much bigger than that. So I, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm okay with it not really living up to anything else. We'll see if maybe... Ghost King next time can win me over. I'll, I'll be excited if that's the case. When Salvatore hits, I think he hits really well. And and I liked the little hints of 4th edition stuff that we got back in Orc King, so I'm I'm excited at least to get to Gauntlegrim. A little trepidatious about Ghost King. I'll see you next time and we'll discuss Ghost King as well as Crystal Mountain, and probably we'll talk about Realms of the Dead. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley. Realms Remembered.